we have liberty in him. And we can trust that through the Lord Jesus Christ and through him alone, we are able to be made right with you. And Father, I pray that you would help us now as we look to this text, as we look to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of our human opinions would be put to the side that all of our false ideas of who you are and who Christ is would be banished out of our minds and that the word of God would give us the only infallible and sure test of what is true and what is right. Father, I ask for a spirit of prayer amongst us this evening, and I pray that the scriptures would encourage us to pray and would prompt us to pray. Help us now as we look to your word Lord, if there's one listening in that does not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, that is yet in their sin, I pray that by your own grace and for your own glory, you would call them out of that state of darkness and that you would be pleased to save them and have mercy upon them. Father, we love you because you first loved us. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter number one, beginning at verse 15. These are the words of God. I'm reading from the King James Bible. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. This is a mountain peak of scripture as we come to the first chapter of Colossians. These epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, are often referred to as either the prison epistles or the Christological epistles. They're referred to as the prison epistles because they were written during Paul's Roman imprisonment. Uh, Paul wrote these epistles while he was behind the bars of a pagan prison. But they're also referred to as the Christological epistles because in these epistles, the apostle Paul does not mince words. He does not beat around the bush. Uh, He does not give us just a tease. But in these epistles, in these letters, And specifically here in the letter to the Colossians, the the Apostle Paul presents the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in clear and emphatic language. You cannot read these epistles and miss who Jesus is. You cannot come to a text such as this and yet remain with, with an excuse as to who the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is. But all of you, having heard these verses... All of you have been introduced to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because you've all been introduced to him, you now have a great responsibility. You now have a great matter that you must deal with. Here it is. Who is Jesus to you? And what have you done with Christ? None of you can say you, you haven't heard of him. None of you can say you that you don't know who he is or what he's done. You, you've read these verses that the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What have you done with this passage? H- have you conformed your life and your desires to what this passage teaches of Jesus Christ? Have you conformed your affections and tuned your heart so that it is aligned with the character and nature of Jesus Christ? 
this is not negotiable. You either get it right on Jesus or you get it wrong. There is no middle ground. But upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ hangs the eternal destiny of all people. And if you miss it on Jesus, if you are not believing in the Jesus of the scriptures, then you have no part in him in eternal life. You must know who Jesus is. And you must place your faith and your trust in him. So as we look at, at these verses, this evening for you, this morning for me, as we look at these verses, I want to give you five headers, five key words that all describe the Lord Jesus Christ, that all describe him. The first is this, God. Did you, did you get that? Jesus Christ is God. Look at verse 15. Who is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He's the image of the invisible God. Now the word here uh, for that word image, it's the same word that we, we get the word icon from. Icon, it is a perfect picture and representation of the thing for which it was designed to display. Paul says here in verse 15, that Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, he is the absolute infallible representation of God Jehovah. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see with full clarity all of the sublime perfections of God. In Jesus Christ, the nature of God and the character of God and the attributes of God and the very heart of God is manifested to us. Now, Paul says that God is invisible. He is the invisible God. And he is invisible because God is a spirit. God has the essence of spirit. And we, by our human limitations, we, we cannot begin in this dimension that we live in. We cannot begin to see God who is spirit. So you say, well, how do I know what God is and what God looks like and what God sounds like and what God is and does and the thoughts of God and the mind of God and the love of God. How do, how do I perceive these things? If you're saying to me that because God is spirit, I cannot commune with him. I cannot see him or hear him. You do so through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the perfect image and communication of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible Jesus Christ has come into the world and has manifested himself through the word of God. He is the eternal Logos. He is the eternal word. And he came with all of the character and fullness of God within himself. He is truly God and yet truly man. And in coming to this earth, he did not lay aside his deity. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, he did not uh, put off his godhood and become man, but rather he was truly and fully God, and he assumed humanity upon himself for the purpose of communing with his people. He's truly God. He is the God of very gods. He is the image of the invisible God. He is co-equal with the Father. He is co-eternal with the Father. All that the Father has is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember in John chapter number 14, when Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And do you remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, have I been this long time with you? And yet thou hast not known me, Philip? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. 
Now, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Father, are obviously two distinct persons that compose the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We affirm the triune God. So what did Jesus mean when he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Obviously, Jesus was not saying that him and the Father were the same person. But rather what Jesus was saying is that all that the Father has, every single attribute of the Father, Jesus Christ possesses as well. And so if you've seen Jesus and you understand his attributes and you understand uh, his nature and his character, then you understand the Father's. And you also understand the Holy Spirit's because he is the image of the invisible God. Paul makes it even more clear in the second chapter of Colossians in verse 9 when he says, For in him, that is in Jesus Christ, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is a spirit. God does not have a body. But Jesus Christ assumed humanity and took upon himself a human body. And in that human body was fully God. And when Jesus Christ came to this earth, that was God walking on the earth. That was God communing with sinners. That was God upon that cross of Calvary. Don't miss that. God. He the Bible does not say, for God so loved the world that he gave us truths to think about for God so loved the world that he gave us thoughts to ponder but God so loved the world that he gave us himself he gave us himself he came from heaven and he he entered into the earth and he became a man he gave us himself and it was him upon the cross. It was God that said it is finished. It was God that said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The gospel required God forsaking God in order to accomplish your redemption. What a sacrifice. Only God could offer up such a sacrifice for his people. Paul goes on to say that he is the firstborn of every creature, the firstborn of every creature. Now, at this point, the cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, uh, they will begin to salivate. They will they will begin to to get very happy because they will think that they have finally found a verse that proves to them that Jesus Christ is actually not God at all, but he's really just the first created being. However, they awfully misinterpret what this verse is teaching us. The very first statement in verse 15 the image of the invisible God rules out forever that Jesus Christ could merely be a created being. But when Paul says that he is the firstborn of every creature, what Paul is saying is that he is first in rank. He is first in authority. He is first in position. He is first in divine right. He is the firstborn. You remember in the Old Testament and in Jewish times, uh, great, great stock was put in the firstborn son. The firstborn son was the heir to all of the father's inheritance. He was the heir of all of the family's possessions. He was the leader of the family in the absence of the father. The firstborn son was one of the most important members of the family. And the Bible says that in the family of God, Jesus Christ has the rights of the firstborn. He is the heir of all of his people. He is the leader of the family. He is our elder brother. What a thought that we have a father in heaven. And we have an elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn of every creature. 
So number one, Jesus is God. He's God. And you must believe that. For if you don't believe that, none of these other things will make any sense. If he's not God, he can't do any of these other things that I'm now going to tell you. Number one, he's God. Number two, he's the creator. He's, Jesus is the creator. Verse 16, for by him, uh, this, this word because, uh, this word for denotes the idea of because. When you're reading verse 16, you could read, instead of the word for, the word because. You could read it like this, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, because, because by him were all things created. In other words, because Jesus is God, and because he is the firstborn, because he is uh, the originator of everything, then of necessity, he must be the creator of all things. Because for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. I hope you're starting to see a common theme in these verses. If you look at these verses, the word all appears seven times. This is a very universal text. The Apostle Paul is not talking about one specific area of life and doctrine, but the Apostle Paul is giving us a big picture look at how the Lord Jesus Christ relates to everything in the universe and all of it, the material created beings and things. And he says that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. Now, at this point, it's very helpful that we understand some of the context of this letter to the Colossians. There in the first century, there was something known as the Colossian heresy, the Colossian heresy. And what that heresy was, it was a first century false teaching, and it was kind of a mixture of Greek philosophy and Eastern mysticism and uh, early forms of Gnosticism. Basically, what the Colossians were falling into believing was this, that there was God in heaven and us on earth. God in heaven and us on earth. And there were these stages of angelic beings that we could climb like a ladder to get to God. And they put Jesus at the top of the ladder. You see, see the, the problem with that, right? They said that here we are on earth and God is in heaven. And in order to get to God, we can't go directly to God. We have to go up this ladder of angelic beings and principalities and spirits. And so when the, the apostle Paul uh, got wind of this false teaching, he dropped anchor right here in verses 15 and 16. He started off by telling the Colossians, Jesus is not the, the best of the angelic beings. Jesus is God himself. And in verse 16, he goes on to say, furthermore, not only is he God himself, but he's the creator of all things. He's not part of any kind of emanation scheme to get to God. He's the creator of all those angelic beings. He's not one of them. <laughs> For by him were all things created. And that is why the Apostle Paul goes on to say, whether in heaven or in earth, visible or invisible. So he's, he's ruled out this Colossian heresy. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. These are spiritual things. These are parts of that Colossian heresy. And Paul says, if they do exist, Jesus Christ is the creator of them. All things, watch this at the end of the verse, were created by him and for him. By him and for him. The word by denotes that all things were created through his creative power. 
He is the one who has spoken the world into existence. He is the one that by the, the power of the word of his mouth has made all things. He is the one that spoke the earth into existence. He is the one who has uh, spoken man into existence and who has breathed life into the nostrils of man. All things were created by him, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, really, no human being has ever created anything. What we do as humans is we take matter that is already created and we make things out of that matter. A human being can build a house, but he uses God's wood and God's bricks and God's insulation and God's glass, right? These are not, we did not create any of those materials. We simply took those materials and put them together. But Jesus Christ has created, as the theologians say, ex nihilo, out of nothing. He created all things. Out of nothing, he created all things. All things were created by him. And, and don't miss this at the end of verse 16. And for him. All things were created by him. And all things were created for him. This for denotes purpose. All things were made so that Jesus Christ would be glorified in creation. Everything you see created, whether it be things in heaven, whether it be the celestial planets and the galaxies and the stars in heaven, or whether it be the things on earth, the trees and the water and the air that we, that we live off of, all of these things were created for Jesus Christ. The purpose of creation is to glorify Jesus Christ. The universe is the grand theater upon which Jesus Christ accomplishes his purposes and manifests his character to us. The world is the theater of God. And in this world, we can watch as God performs mighty wonders and as God does miraculous things through his people and as God uh, sends his own son into the world and as God saves a, a group of people from fallen humanity. He does all of that in the world. God, who is not limited by time or space, has created time and space and has then entered into it to accomplish his will. Only our God can do such a thing. How great is our God. Jesus Christ is God. Verse 16, Jesus Christ is creator. But I want you to, to see this. In verse 17, Jesus Christ is sustainer. He is sustainer. Verse 17, and he is before all things he is before all things and by him all things consist now again this this phrase he is before all things uh, don't think about this in a sense of time it's not just that jesus christ predated all things for jesus christ is eternal jesus christ uh existed before there was a before <laughs> Before there was ever time, there was Jesus Christ. But when it, when it says that he is before all things, it means that Jesus Christ, in his rank and in his power and in his sovereignty, sits above all things. And there is nothing more important than him. There's nothing more powerful than him. Uh, there is nothing uh, that rises to a greater value than him in other words he's he is the seat of primacy for the whole universe he's the cornerstone he's also the capstone he's the beginning of all things he is the end of all things he is before all things and anytime you try to put something before jesus christ it will end in utter confusion for nothing can exist unless Jesus Christ goes before it. 
He's before all things. And, and this, this phrase is such a wonderful phrase. And by him, all things consist. By him, all things consist. Again, by him, by his power, through the, the might of Jesus Christ alone. He doesn't need any help to do this work. He doesn't need any assistance to perform what he's performing in verse 17. It's all by him, by him alone. And by him, all things, all people, all government, all worlds, all galaxies, they all consist. They are all upheld and sustained by the monergistic power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are here tonight because you're sustained by Jesus Christ. You are where you are in life because you're sustained. You are consisting in Jesus Christ. That's true for elect and non-elect. That's true for Americans and Filipinos. Uh, that, that's true for created things. That's true for the angelic beings. It's true for the material things. It's true for the immaterial things. All things are consisting in Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus Christ is the point of integration for all things. That all things find their relationship, find their sanity, find their place in the universe as they relate to Jesus Christ. This is why when people and ideas seek to be as anti-God as they can, and they seek to run from Jesus Christ as far as they can, the end of all of those things is insanity. Insanity. We have people in our country uh, that, that believe that, that it, it's okay to murder babies in the womb. We have people in our country that, that believe that that you can be whatever gender you want to be. We have people in our country that, that think that uh, a man can wake up one morning and just decide that he's a woman. Where does that come from? That comes from shaking your fist at God and saying, I don't want the Lord Jesus Christ to govern my function and my being. And when you stray away from the great uniter of the world, Jesus Christ, you will wind up in insanity. Nothing makes sense apart from Jesus Christ. This world, it would be like, it would be like a million tornadoes all at once. And, and then you, you go up to the top of them and drop confetti in them. And that confetti is blown everywhere. That's what the world is like when Jesus Christ is not the sustainer and the consister of all things. And what a kindness of our God that even as mankind is rebelling and running and resisting and fighting and going into sin and going into wickedness and going into idolatry, Jesus Christ still continues to sustain the world. All he would have to do is but take his hand, his sustaining hand off of the world, and we would disintegrate in an instant. Because the Bible says, in him, we live and we move and we have our being. God, Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of all things has by his creative power so connected himself to the world that he also sustains all things. This also obliterates the false teaching of open theism. 
open theism or deism, as it is sometimes called, is the false belief that God created the world and he set it in motion. But then he took a step out of the world and he just let things play out. What a false ideology. Not only did Jesus Christ not do that, but on the contrary, he is involved in every intricate detail of the world. One hair could not fall from your head without the explicit permission of Jesus Christ, because he is the sustainer of all things. One bird could not fall from the sky without the sovereign ordination of Jesus Christ, <laughs> because he sustains all things. Verse 17, he is the sustainer. But now I want you to look at verse 18 as we go through this text. See, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is creator. Jesus Christ is sustainer. But fourthly, and perhaps the most controversial, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is sovereign. He has been exalted to the throne whereupon he sits as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when he sounds forth a decree, that decree comes to us with the full weight of God's sovereign authority behind it. He's Lord. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. No, he goes on to say that he is the head of the body, the church. Now, you and I know that this is a very specific group of people that he is here addressing. He is talking about the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the body of believers, the visible and local body of believers that have been redeemed by his own blood, that have been assimilated together. And the Bible says he's the head of the church. Now, all of you who have been added to the church, you all serve various functions. And what a beautiful thing that is. Some of you are a hip. Some of you are a, a hand. Some of you are a foot. Some of you are a mouth. But there's only one head. There's only one head. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has a duplicit crown right over us. He, he is sovereign over us by virtue of the fact that he's the creator. But he's also sovereign over us in virtue of the fact that he's our redeemer and Lord. And we as his body are obligated to yield full obedience to him. We as his body are required to do his bidding and to serve him in whatsoever he bids us to do. Because he is the head of the church. He's the king of his kingdom. He's the ruler of his household. He's the head of the body, the church, who, Jesus Christ, is the beginning. And again, this is not talking about chronological order, but this is talking about the fact that the church begins and ends with Jesus Christ. And anyone who is going to be a member of the Lord's church must bow the knee to the Lordship of Christ. Rebels are not fit to be members of his body. Those who know nothing of his grace, who know nothing of his law, who know nothing of his word, are not meet to be partakers of the membership of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is a group that consists of those who understand that Jesus Christ is God and Lord. 
Do, do you understand that this evening? I, I must ask. Do you just give a formal agreement to it? Do you just say with your mouth, well, Jesus is Lord, but then you go on and live however you want? Do you just do you just acknowledge it? When I say Jesus is Lord, you say amen, amen. But then as soon as this service is over, you're going to go on and do something that proves that you really don't believe that he's Lord at all. The church is for people that not only confess and believe that he's Lord, but it's for people that live in light of the fact that he is Lord. And, and I'm not asking you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I'm telling you that he is Lord of your life. Whether you want to obey him or not, he's Lord. And what I beseech you to do is to no longer resist the Lordship of Christ, but to bow the knee to Christ's Lordship and serve him with gladness. But you will bow. You, you will confess. He is Lord. Thus saith the scriptures. He is Lord. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning. He's also the firstborn from the dead. And I, I think there's a twofold meaning here. Jesus Christ is the leader of the resurrection. He is the one who will return. And when he returns, the dead in Christ shall be resurrected and shall go on to meet him and be with him forever. But he is also the first man to ever be resurrected unto glorification. Now, yes, it's true that there were other men resurrected before the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the grave. But Lazarus is not the firstborn from the dead because Lazarus was raised to an old way of life. When Lazarus was resurrected, he still had all of the infirmities of his humanity. And Lazarus, after he was resurrected, went on to die again. But Jesus Christ has risen to die no more. He has risen to never die again. That is the beauty of Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. And catch this phrase. Let, let this next phrase jump off the page. That in all things. And what are the all things? Well, look at verse 16. By him were all things created. Verse 17, he is before all things. Verse 18, it's talking about the same all things. It means all things. All things. <laughs> that in all things, he might have the preeminence. That in all things, Jesus Christ might sit alone in a seat of primacy. In first place, nothing rivaling the position of the Lord Jesus Christ, that in all things he might have the preeminence, not just in your church life, not just in your family life, not just in your personal devotions, but in all things, in every thought you ever think, in every word you ever speak, in everything you ever do. That he might have preeminence in all things. That he might have preeminence in the church. That he might have preeminence in the civil government. That he might have preeminence in entertainment. That he might have preeminence in the arts. That he might have preeminence in our teaching. That he might have preeminence in our music. That he might have preeminence in science. That he might have preeminence in math. That he might have preeminence in history. That he might have preeminence in everything. For he is Lord over all. And because he's Lord over all, he is preeminent in all things. You say, how is the Lord Jesus Christ 
preeminent in mathematics. Well, I'll tell you how. How could two plus two equal four if Hinduism was true and all is one? Four is a, is a mystery, four doesn't exist. But because Jesus Christ is the creator and sustainer of all things, he is the one who holds all of these laws together. Because Jesus is risen from the dead, two plus two equals four. And because Jesus is risen from the dead, the laws of nature function as they ought to. Jesus is the one who has ordained all of these things to structure and function the way that they have. And he has preeminence in all things. And if you're going to understand anything, you must realize that Jesus is preeminent in it. You must study everything from the vantage point of Christ. Make Jesus Christ your starting point for everything you do. Get up in the morning and tie your shoes with Jesus Christ as being preeminent over that activity. The Lordship of Jesus Christ should radically change the way you do everything. You should do nothing being unaffected by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's not one area of your life where his Lordship does not reach in and shake you by the shoulders and say, I am preeminent. He's preeminent over all things. He's Lord. Lastly, and then I'll be done. Verse uh, 19 and 20. Jesus Christ is Redeemer. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer. Look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. There's that word all again. What is he talking about? That word all. I believe that this verse is telling us that it, the father is pleased because in Jesus Christ, we find the sufficiency for everything that we or the created world could ever need. In Jesus Christ, all the fullness dwells, all the fullness of deity, all the fullness of lordship, all the fullness of creation, all the fullness of sustenance. And when Jesus Christ provides for our needs, when Jesus Christ communes with us, when Jesus Christ gives to us, he does so from the abundance of himself. Because all fullness is in him. And it's pleased the father for that to be so. The father looks upon the Lord Jesus and he is so pleased with what he sees in his dear son. There's not one thing lacking in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus could never improve in any way. He's perfect. He is absolutely wonderful. There's nothing that he needs that he doesn't have. There's nothing that he needs to do that he can't do. There's not one attribute that he doesn't have that he needs. In him, all fullness dwells. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. The crown of work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the highlight of highlights for the ministry of Jesus Christ was the work that he did on Calvary's cross. When he shed his life's blood on the cross, when he gave himself up, when he died upon the cross. And the Bible says, <clears throat> That in that death, he has made peace. He's made peace. Well, peace denotes the idea of estrangement and hostility. Well, who are the hostile parties? Well, man was not hostile against man. 
for uh, man was they were all gone astray. They were all sinners. Uh, man was actually enjoying one another quite well in the chasing after their sin and wickedness. Now, Jesus Christ has brought peace, not between man and man, not between God and God, for God has always eternally fellowship with one another, but he has brought peace between holy God and sinful man. And not only that, but he has brought peace between a holy God and everything, both man and both immaterial world that has been affected by the curse of sin. The, the him joy to the world. The line says, he comes to make his blessing known far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. And every rose bush that has been cursed with thorns. Jesus Christ in his death on the cross. Has paved the way for restoration and redemption. Every poisonous leaf that was made so by the fall, Jesus Christ in his death on the cross has come to remove the effects of the curse. He drank the totality of sin's curse on the cross. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things. Again, we have to we have to let the scriptures speak for themselves. This all things, it's the same all things that we've been talking about this whole time. It is all people. It is all created being. It is everything. Now, I must be very careful because I am not uh, preaching any kind of universalism. And this verse is not teaching any kind of universalism. This verse is not teaching that all men will be saved, will be reconciled salvifically. But you see, when you reconcile something, you can do it in one of two ways. You can reconcile things by changing them and uh, causing them to no longer be an enemy, but be a friend. Or you can reconcile them by a complete, utter, and eternal destruction of those things. See, some men, some of you will be reconciled unto salvation. Some of you have been reconciled unto salvation. And what a glorious thing that is, that Jesus Christ has saved you and has redeemed you. But others of you will be reconciled unto damnation. You will be reconciled by spending an eternity having the justice of God and the wrath of God meted out to you. But you will bow the knee and you will confess and you will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. On the last day, there will be no unorthodox statements. All will confess that Jesus is Lord and he will be the reconciler of the world. To God. He's come to reconcile all things unto himself, to put all things into their proper perspectives as they relate to Jesus Christ. By him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in earth or things in heaven. It was Abraham Kuyper who said that there's not one square inch in the whole domain in which we live upon which the Lord Jesus does not cry, mine, mine. It's all his. And because it's all his, we are obligated to live 
under his rule and his sovereignty. One man said, if you would like to live by your own rules and by your own sovereignty, then all you need to do is create your own world and create your own earth. But as long as you're using God's earth and breathing God's air, you're responsible to God. Now, I know this is a prayer meeting. And this message did not directly deal with the subject of prayer. However, I know of no greater motivation to pray than seeing the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up like we've seen him. To see him in the full radiance of scripture to see him in truth this is the lord jesus christ what are you going to do with christ he's god he's created all things he currently sustains all things he is the lord over all things and he will redeem and reconcile all things to himself how is he going to reconcile you? Is he going to reconcile you through peace and through grace and through mercy? Have you trusted in him? Have you believed on him? Or is he going to reconcile you through wrath and justice as you spend an eternity in the lake of fire? All of us will go to one of these two places. All of us will be reconciled in one of these two ways. And I've presented Christ to you. And he stands ready to receive sinners unto himself. What are you going to do with Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this high.